We're speaking over these next couple of weeks about the keys to spiritual growth. And last week we talked about growing in Christ, spending time with him both alone and with others, and that that's one of the keys to spiritual growth. And today we're going to talk about another key to spiritual growth and one of our values as a church, which is relationships, building each other up. And if you think about relationships, you know, there's a lot of research that has been done that shows that relationships are part of what makes us healthy, not only spiritually, but also physically. In fact, the American Psychological Association said that relationships influence conditions of cancer, heart disease, depression, and addiction, and that there's a strong relationship between good relationships and, and a 50% likelihood of survival. And, and, and that just means that the American Psychological Association is saying that relationships are very important to your physical health. And it's not just the American Psychological Association, it's also the National Institute of Health, which says that people who have social relationships are likely to live longer, to be healthier, and to be happier. And then, you know, this is the National Institute of Health. They said that religion, combined with relationships, um, also has tremendous physical benefits to people. So there you go. And I just, it's, I thought it must have pained them to say that, but they did. <laughs> so if, if you add religion and relationships, you're unlocking one of the keys, not only to physical health, but especially to spiritual health, and I was um, sent actually an article by my, um, by my dad that was written right at, at the time of Easter by the Archbishop of New York, that's Cardinal Dolan, it was in the Wall Street Journal, and he was writing on this, well, tendency that, that people have right now to want religion without relationship. You know, they, they want something of God, but not with other people. And he, he writes this, he, he says, I do worry though, as I note people drifting from the family of the church, Faith is deeply personal, but it is not private. By its nature, faith is communal. A congregation is a spiritual family. And then he goes on to write this. He says, in the scripture, it is clear that God prefers to form a people, a community, and not simply a collection of atomized individuals. Faith must always be internalized, but it is always expressed strengthened and lived out with others. And then this is my favorite part. Are you ready for my favorite part of, of what he wrote? He wrote this, this is how he ends. He says, people tell us they want to believe but not belong, that they want faith but not religion, that they prefer spirituality, whatever that might mean, to communal worship. They seem to want God as father but to remain his only child. Jesus as good shepherd if they're the only lamb in the flock. They want a God by themselves, Christ without his church. Sorry, but that isn't how God works. I thought that was so well written. And, and the reason I like it is because what he's writing is exactly what the scripture teaches. In fact, we read in 1 John 4, 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So the teaching of scripture and in fact, God's command for us is that we are to have loving relationships, that we're to build each other up and to enjoy good and deep spiritual relationships. And the question is, how do we do that, especially because relationships are tricky and, and people are difficult? I mean, present company excluded, of course, but other people are difficult and it's hard to love them and, and hard to be in relationships. And no wonder then that people want to withdraw from relationships, be isolated and alone and say, yes, I would like God, but I would like him without any of the other people that, that are hard to love. And so what do we do? Well, I want to look with you at, at one passage. It's 1 Peter 4, verses 8 and 9. And these two sentences give us a, a lot of material to consider and also to apply to our lives. So let me read the passage. This is God's word for us. And here's what he says. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers over a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So above everything else, we're to keep loving each other and with an earnest love. And he says, one of the ways that we show love is, is through hospitality, and it's a hospitality that doesn't grumble. So I'm just gonna take these phrases because each one of them is important and, and look at them as we make our way through these, these two sentences. The first thing he says is, above all, which means that love is the most important thing. It's the most important. This is the teaching of scripture. In fact, in the scriptures in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. 
So in our relationships with everybody else, above all, most important, we're to have love. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 13 says that if you don't have love, you are nothing. In fact, even if you've got incredible spiritual gifts, if you speak and you don't have love, you're like a resounding gong. And if you serve people and and you're caring for people, but you do it without love, the scripture says you are nothing. And the reason for that is because God values love. And more than that, the scripture says that God values love so much, God is love. So if you're thinking about how do I become healthy spiritually, above all, most important, you are to love others. Jesus says this in John 13. He says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if if you have love for one another. This is how people identify Christians because they love one another. They care for each other and they love each other with the love of God himself. So above all, love one another. And then here's the next phrase, keep loving one another earnestly. Keep loving one another. And I think it's clear that God has to say keep loving because it's tempting to stop loving. I mean, you can start with love and then very quickly get to annoyance, frustration, and even anger. You can begin with loving people and then find that you run out of love. And so the scripture says, keep loving, don't quit, don't stop, but keep loving one another. Well, you know, you and I need a love that doesn't quit. We need somebody to love us with an unconditional love because if if somebody's going to love us with conditions, we'll find that we quickly don't qualify. In in other words, very quickly, we we are disqualified from deserving love. And so we need a love, which is an unconditional love, an eternal love. And we also need to give that love to others, a love that endures all things. That's from 1 Corinthians 13 as well, that love endures all things. That means that when you're loving somebody, they will do things that make it hard to love them. And yet you endure, you keep loving whether you're in a marriage, whether that's in a family, whether that's people in the church, whether that's somebody on the other side of the world that you hear about and you feel frustrated about, but the scripture says that you are to endure all things and to keep loving. I wonder if you're running low on love, if you find yourself just sort of going on empty. I I had a a man that I knew years ago whose greatest ambition in life was um, to pull into the gas station when his car is on empty. And, and in fact, the, he was like, he had the, the best day of his life when one day he drove into the gas station, ran out of gas and coasted up to the pump and he was just elated. But, but more than once, he ran out of gas on the road. And I'm wondering if on the road of life, you are running out of love. And uh, there's a way to test that. You can know if you're running out of love by how you are responding to people. Do you find yourself annoyed with people? Frustrated? Are you muttering about people under your breath? Or, or, or not even under your breath, are you telling others how frustrated you are with the people around you, even maybe telling the people who are frustrating you, expressing, if not through words, through your, your nonverbals, how annoyed you are and how irritated you are? And if you, if you can identify that, if you can be honest, then the truth is you're running low on love and And how do you get a love that keeps loving, that doesn't run out? And the answer is that you have to go to God for this because God is love. He is, in fact, the source of love. In 1 John 4, 7, we're told this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And then in verse 19, he says, We love because he first loved us. In other words, you can't give an unconditional eternal love unless you've received it. Because naturally, you don't have it. Naturally, you have a conditional love. You have a love that you can give um, when it's convenient to you, when the other person seems like they deserve it or have earned it. Then you can give love, but to have a love that doesn't run out, that doesn't go on to empty, you need to be connected to the source, which is Jesus. Listen, before you can love others, With this type of love, you have to receive it from God. And so can I just pause for a moment here and say, if you don't have a relationship with God through Christ, the most important thing for you to do today is to get into a relationship with God through Jesus 
and to experience his love, his forgiveness, his acceptance, his belonging, his hospitality into the family of God. And when you receive that, then you'll have something that you can give to other people. And if you're a Christian and you have been spending time away from the Lord, disconnected, as it were, from, from the source of love, then no wonder that you run out. No wonder that your tank is, is on empty. No wonder that you're on fumes and maybe even on the road of life, um, completely depleted of the type of love which God calls you to and which would be for you a sign and a source of spiritual health. You see, Christ is the source of unconditional love and we're to stay connected with him, which is why last week, We talked about growing in Christ and said we need times alone with the Lord where we're reading the scripture, where we're praying, where we're connecting with Jesus and we're receiving his truth and his love. And we need times with other people, whether it's attending church or life group or a Bible study, where we are receiving fresh supplies of God's love, where we're we're connecting with God through those means of grace, through those channels that God's love and truth and, and, and his presence flow so that we can receive them. You see, we we come to church in part to give God the praise that he deserves, but we also come to receive the love which God has for us so that we can experience that love which makes us want to worship him even more and also so that we can love other people and especially people who are difficult to love. And by the way, that's everybody and it's you. We have to stay connected to this love um, of Christ. Fresh supplies, don't quit. And if you don't have Christ as the source of your love, you will run out, you will run dry. You may love for a minute or a month or maybe for a year, but eventually the reservoir of love will get down to the very bottom and you will find that you have nothing left to give. And that is a condition in which, of course, many of us have already found ourselves. And so the command, keep loving each other, throws us back into dependence on Jesus. Do you see the scripture is constantly pushing us back to depend on him, to cling to him, to be connected to him because we are called to do what we cannot do on our own, what we can only do through Christ, through Christ who is our strength. And that's why the scriptures say, I can do all things through Christ. That doesn't mean that, that I, can, I can run through a brick wall with Christ. It means you can, you can do the impossible of loving people unconditionally only through Christ. And there's an important reason why We're to love people, but before I get to that, let me just describe what this love looks like. It's important to note this, that we're to keep loving one another earnestly. You know what that word earnestly means? That means it has to be genuine. It's gotta be sincere. You you can't fake this love. You can't pretend to have it. You can't give a synthetic love. You can't give a, a gritting your teeth forced love. This love is to be sort of a natural overflow of the love that God is giving you. When I was in high school, I went to church with my parents and there was, there was one woman, maybe there was more, but there was one woman in particular that I always felt uncomfortable around because she was trying so hard to love people. Have you been around somebody like that? Like you could almost see her gritting her teeth to love people and she wore a smile on her face all the time, like whether it was appropriate or not, she had a giant smile on her face And to me, it felt plastic. And look, it could be that I'm just very cynical, that I was cynical even as a high schooler. But I'm telling you, I'm convinced that she heard a sermon by somebody saying that we're to love one another. And she said, I'm going to do it. Even the people I don't love, I'm going to love them in the most churchy way possible. And it just felt off. Have you experienced that before? She's so excited to see you. Uh, you don't even know me. Like, how can, why are you, how can you be that excited? Like, it, it just doesn't feel right. And, and what I'm saying is, it wasn't genuine. That wasn't her personality. That was her performance. Have you been around that? Don't do that. Don't do that. But instead, God has given you a personality which he wants to flood with the presence of his love. And then with the love of Christ filling you, then you express, you express the love of God. And this is, this is what God is saying. He says in, in Romans 12, 9, let love be genuine. A genuine love is a natural, actually a supernatural overflow from our connection with Christ. Maybe you remember Psalm 23 where the, David, the psalmist says, my cup runneth over. 
If you could imagine a cup and you're pouring into it and then it just overflows. He's saying the love of God, which he has a limitless supply of love, he will pour it out on you and it will just begin to overflow. And when I have been around people who who were just vessels that were overflowing with God's love, what a sharp contrast between the synthetic plastic love that was a performance instead of the love which was a natural overflow of relationship with Jesus. I feel convicted by that. Do you feel convicted by that? It's, it, but it's God calling you, connect with me. And there's an important reason to do this. An important reason, above all, to keep loving one another. And that is because love covers over, do you see that in the passage? Love covers a multitude of sins. The same word of covering in the Greek is used when Jesus is in the boat. Do you remember this story? There's a storm, and in, in some translations it says that the storm was, was swamping the boat, but it's actually the same word as covering the boat, just wave after wave covering the boat. And what, what, what the passage is saying here, what God is speaking to us, is that when we love others with the love of God, it's like one wave of love after another that covers the other person, a wave covering them. Or if I could use a a more domestic and and perhaps a more modern example, it's like putting a blanket over something. My wife has been away this week, let's just say hypothetically, that we got, my my son and I got a stain on the couch, hypothetically, and we couldn't get it out. What, What do you do? Let me tell you, man, this is easy. You get a blanket and you put it over. You, and, and a nice blanket covers over the stain beautifully. And then you don't see it. And it's perfect. And what, what the scripture is saying is that when you love people, it's like a blanket that covers over their sins. It just covers it over. It's still there. It's, it, you, you haven't removed the sin. You haven't removed the stain. Uh, but but it's covered over with the the beautiful blanket of love. When we love people with this divine love, with this love of God, it covers over their, their stain of sin. And if it covers over sin, and, and sin is, that's the worst, then it also covers over what is less than sin, but what, and that is what is offensive or annoying. I mean, sometimes we struggle to love people not because they've sinned against us, but because they're annoying, you know, they're, they're tapping. And you're like, that's not a sin but it gets close to it if they don't stop after a while, right? Like, you're like it's hard to love somebody. Like the, and love covers over that. And in fact, w- what we read in Proverbs is this. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers over all offenses. Yeah, just the things that offend you, that annoy you, that get under your skin. When you love people, not with your love, but with the divine love of God, it covers over the ugliness of their sin and I think we have sayings for this. Have you heard the saying, he has a face only a mother could love? Have you heard a saying like that? I have. And, and I, just, I want to ask you, why is it that a mother isn't put off by the ugly face? And the answer, you know this, it's because the mother has a love that covers it. it the love of the mother doesn't change the face, it just covers it. And, and when we have the love of Christ for other people, it doesn't make them beautiful. It covers them with the love of Christ. You see, God is calling us to this in a very practical way. And one of the ways we do that is by forgiving people. Forgiving doesn't remove the offense. It covers it. In 1 Corinthians 13, I keep going back to this passage on love. It says, not only that love endures all things, but it says love keeps no record of wrongs. You know, sometimes when we think of, uh, of forgiveness, we think that it means that we, we don't remember it, that we somehow forget it. That isn't what it means. It means you don't keep a record. It means you, you haven't written it down and put it in your back pocket so that you could pull it out and review it with the other person on a regular basis. When you love somebody, you say, I'm not gonna keep a record of that. It happened, that's true, it's real, but I'm not keeping a record. And, it, and the reason for that is because I've experienced the love of God and now I see you covered with the love of Jesus. Are you seeing people, maybe even the people in your own home, covered with the love of Jesus? I've shared this before, but and it happened years ago, and it still is so fresh in my mind. There was an older couple, when when my wife and I were newly married, an older couple that I just marveled at, Mary and George. And they were an amazing couple because Mary covered George with love. Because George 
He was a great guy. I mean, he had a heart as big as the ocean, but so is his mouth. I mean, he was always talking and telling stories, most of which were very likely untrue. And, uh, and it was awkward. There were times where it was just awkward because he just talked so much. But when you looked at Mary, she, she, was, she was short and he was tall, and she just looked up at him with the most adoring look on her face. Here is this older woman looking up at, at, her, at her nonstop talking husband as if he was just spinning gold. I mean, she was just, there was this love that covered him. And when, when you saw the way she loved him, it made it easier to love him also. Do you know what I mean? There was something about that that was inspiring. It, it, it wasn't because she had a romantic love for him. It's because she had a Christian love for her husband. And it covered over all of his flaws. Have you heard the saying, love is blind? I have. I have when I was with my wife and people looked at me and looked at her and said, love is blind. And they said, love is blind because what, I, what they were noticing is that her love covered over a multitude of of flaws, and that's the only way we could get married is if her love covered over a multitude of flaws. But I have to tell you, there's a problem with that kind of love, that romantic love. It wears off. It does. I mean, if you are in the beginning of a relationship right now and you feel that romantic love and, and people are saying to you, well, love is blind, what they mean is it, it wears off after time, it runs out, and you can't keep loving with romantic love it, it, because what happens is the blanket slips off of the couch. I mean, eventually, that's what happens. The blanket slips off of the couch and, and you go, look, that, that has been there the whole time. The whole time. How could I have missed that? The whole time you have been annoying and I didn't even know it because love had covered it over. And that means that if you're relying on, on a natural love, a love which you're summoning from within yourself, you will find that you cannot keep this passage. And in fact, you will find that your relationship struggle, that your spiritual health is compromised. You must receive from Christ himself this unconditional, eternal love, this divine love that keeps loving and covers over a multitude of sins. How do we do this? How do we do this? After being told that we are above all to keep loving earnestly because it covers over a multitude of sins, he gives us a very practical example and his example is this, it's to show hospitality to one another. Show hospitality to one another. Hospitality is love in action. It's one of the ways that we express love is to show hospitality. I, I think it's a lost art. Um, I, I think this is something we do less frequently. But hospitality, let me just give you my definition. It's sharing what we have with those we love. What we have with those we love. And, and, and who is it that we love? was to be others, the one another. In fact, the, the Greek word for hospitality is philozenos. And philozenos is two words, philo mean, meaning friend, and xenos meaning stranger or other. So it's a, a friendly action towards somebody who is an other, a stranger, alien to you. And when we show this type of love to others, then we're practicing hospitality. And in fact, hospitality is so important that twice when the scripture is talking about who qualifies for leadership in the church, who can be an elder, the list includes hospitality, that you have to be somebody who practices hospitality to be a leader in the church. In other words, you may know everything there is to know about the Bible. You may, you may be um, brilliant, maybe you're a great singer, but if you don't practice hospitality, you cannot be a leader in the church. That means that God is elevating hospitality to a high level to say, listen, when you really love people, you practice hospitality. And I guess here, here's what I'm asking you. Are you practicing hospitality? Are you practicing hospitality? And let me give you some modern examples. And I want to, I want to begin with some examples of church because I, sometimes I hear from people a criticism that churches don't work together. So let me give you some, some examples of hospitality from churches. We have a campus that just started um, in Mechanicsburg, the Pike, and they were looking for a place to hold Wednesday night classes, and so they went to another church in Mechanicsburg. Um, you, if this was business, it, it would be a rival, but we're not rivals, we're, we're brothers and sisters. They went to a place called Hope Church, and they said, can we use two classrooms? And Hope Church said, 
we will set aside two classrooms only for you. And they said, great. And the first Wednesday night that they showed up to use those classrooms, the people from Hope Church had set out iced tea, lemonade, and cookies. That's hospitality. I mean, doesn't that make you feel good? Like, that's, that's the love of Christ in action. And, and some years ago, when, we, when our, our campus in Mount Holly was looking for a church building to meet in, or any building to meet in, even maybe a storage shed, because we didn't know where we would meet, New Life Church um, in Carlisle had a building in Mount Holly, and we asked, could we, could we use that building? And they said, yes, we'd be happy to share it with you. And when we moved into the building, there were not enough chairs in the room, and they said, we have more chairs in Carlisle, and we will bring them to you, and you can borrow our chairs. I mean, just this expression of generosity. You see, that's hospitality, where you say, here's what I have, and I would like you to use it. That's hospitality. Are you practicing that? Because you love others. Because the love of Christ is at work within you. Let me give you some examples of, of ways that you personally could practice hospitality. Um, I, I stole some of these examples from other people. I was asking them. I, I talked to a man who, who did construction, and he said, when we would go into somebody's house, sometimes people would lay out cookies for us and offer us something to drink. And he said, you know, I mean, we always did good work, but we especially did good work for those people. <laughs> Show hospitality when people come into your home or your apartment. Maybe they have some work to do. Offer them something to eat. Offer them something to drink. That's a way of, of, of tangibly showing the love of Jesus Christ. When you have somebody over for dinner, somebody was telling me we were invited over to dinner and we have children and they said, what do your children like to eat? And they said, oh, that just made it so... They, they were thoughtful because... Our children like to eat very little. And so we, we knew that this was a stressful situation um, and how thoughtful of them to ask that. Are you practicing hospitality? Um, maybe not just in your home, but in your church? Do you make people feel welcome? Not by wearing a plastic smile, but, but genuinely welcoming people, smiling, speaking to them. And, and here's, here's an important thing that you can do. Introduce them to other people. It's very difficult to come into a church if you don't know people. And so you can show hospitality by greeting people, introducing them to others. You can show hospitality by buying groceries for somebody, by driving them. And here's my challenge for you. I'm going to raise the bar of hospitality. Show hospitality to someone who is different than you. You see that word philoxenos, that word hospitality for the stranger, for the alien? Who, who is somebody that's not like you that you can show hospitality to so that not just other people in the world, but that the heavenly realms that are watching us live, that the heavenly realms would, would look at what you're doing and say, why? Why is she showing hospitality? Why is, she, is he showing hospitality to this person? They have nothing in common. There's no human explanation. The only, only explanation is that the unconditional, eternal love of Christ is in them, and that is why they're showing hospitality to others and inviting them into relationship. It's a loving hospitality that is the key to spiritual health. And here, I, I wanted to share with you one of the most intriguing passages in the Bible that when you show hospitality, you could be showing hospitality to a divine being, to an angel. In um, Hebrews 13, verses 1 and 2, it says, let brotherly love continue. You see that? Brotherly love, that's that, that philo love, like Philadelphia, the brotherly love. Let that love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. After church, uh, maybe you could invite somebody to your home. You could be inviting an angel. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? Although I have to say, we've not been amazing at, at hospitality or even good at hospitality, but we've invited people into our home to stay with us on a couple of occasions. And I can promise you, guarantee you, none of them were angels. So we, I mean, I have, we have evidence. Um, and in fact, it, it's, there were times where it was so difficult that we tended towards grumbling. Do you know what I mean? We, we started off good saying, come on in. Yes, of course, we'd love to have you stay with us. And then after time, uh, one friend of mine in particular, we invited in. He was struggling, and we said, yes, we would love to have you come stay with us, and we did. We loved it, and we loved him. But you know the saying that um, after three days, both fish and guests start to stink? After three months, we were like, this is, oh, this is, this is hard. And our natural love ran out, and we had to come to Christ to receive his supernatural love because we were 
we were drifting into grumbling. And here's the last thing that the passage says, that we're to show hospitality without grumbling, a, a hospitality free of grumbling. And that is extremely hard to do because people are difficult and it won't be long. In fact, if you have people with you for any length of time, it won't be long that you'll begin to see their flaws, their annoying behaviors, and even their sins. And, and the challenge will be to continue to love them and not to grumble about it, not to be muttering about it under your, your breath. How, how can we show love and hospitality to others without grumbling? I want to give you a secret. The way to love other people is to see that your expressions of love to them are, are to Christ himself. When you're loving other people, that you are expressing love to Jesus. When you show hospitality to somebody, you are showing hospitality to Jesus. L look at Matthew 10, 40. Jesus says, whoever receives you, receives me. And whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Do you see that what the passage is, is speaking to us is this, that when you show hospitality to a person, you are showing it to Christ. Now, I have to explain, it doesn't mean that the person is Christ. It, it doesn't mean that they have become Jesus. The person that we invited into our house who lived there for three months, he was, he's a great guy, but he wasn't Christ. And so we had to have boundaries. We had to be wise. This isn't saying cast aside all wisdom and this is Jesus himself incarnate in your house. No, what it's saying is whatever you do for the least of these, you do for Jesus. If you set out cookies for the people working in your house or in your apartment, you are setting them out for Jesus, not because they're Jesus, but because you are expressing love, the love of God for the people he created. And so the way that we, that we avoid running out is not only staying connected to Christ, but we say, I'm doing this not, not just for you, but I'm doing it for Jesus. And the reason we can love Jesus is because he first loved us. And let me tell you what is, I'll stop after this, I promise, but I have to get to this. The most amazing thing about the love of Jesus is that it is unlike our love. We've been talking about the love that we get from Jesus and we give to people and it covers over their offenses, it covers over their sins, but the love of Jesus doesn't cover our sins, it cleanses our sins. That, that is the miracle of the gospel, that when Jesus loves us and we receive his love, he doesn't just cover over our love, or over our sins, he removes them, he takes out the stain, and he leaves us purer than snow. He removes the sin from us as far as the east is from the west, and when you experience that from God, what I'm saying is, you and I who have been sinful, who are covered in shame and guilt, when we recognize that we don't deserve to be loved, and we come to Jesus, and he pours out on us, overflows on us his cleansing love and we see he's not just embarrassed about my loving he's covered or about my sin and he's covered it over he has removed it then we love him even more we love him even more and and it makes us capable of loving the stranger of loving the stranger with the love of Jesus Christ who by the way loved us when we were strangers loved us when we were still sinners, so that, above all, above all, we could keep loving one another earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins and show, so show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the great hospitality which, which God has shown to us through Jesus Christ. That, Lord, you gave your life willingly that we might be brought into the house of God. And you have received us not as guests, but as children of God. You have adopted us as sons and daughters. Father, from the security of that relationship with you, being in a place of eternal love and of unconditional love, may we love one another. And may we do it in ways that people can see and feel and hear so that your name would be glorified and that your church would be healthy. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.